Let us, let us hear from you, Lord, and then give us the courage to do your will, your way. This prayer we ask in the name of your Son, who is our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. All the participants said, Amen. And so, uh, for those who are returning for the second uh, time, the second day, uh, you were introduced to Dr. Henry Allen. Uh, last week. Uh, for those who may be with us for the first time, uh, we provided a, 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 a brief background for Dr. Allen and for our speakers. Uh, and so I encourage you to read some of that. Uh, but Dr. Allen is a, a retired uh, a professor, uh, taught for many years at uh, Wheaton College. Uh, he also taught at the Rochester Institute of Technology uh, and at uh, Bethel College and Calvin College. And so he's been around academia for a minute. Uh, he is um, well-traveled and, and well-known uh, in the sociological circles. And so you will be introduced to uh, Dr. Allen uh, by himself very shortly. Uh, Dr. Uh, Jensen is a, an associate professor of Christian education at the Samuel David Proctor School of Theology in Virginia. Uh, this is her first uh, session with us, and we're looking forward uh, to hearing uh, from Dr. Jensen and to learning uh, from her. Uh, she is a graduate of the University of Sioux Falls, uh, uh, Northwest Baptist Theological Seminary, and the Garrett Evangelical Theological Seminary, where she earned her PhD. Dr. Jensen is a, an author, a scholar practitioner. Uh, she's a, a, a pastor preacher, and she's not afraid uh, to be in places where other people might find this conference. So we're looking forward to this conversation this morning, looking forward to being uh, led in the way of God. Just a couple of reminders for us this morning. Uh, first of all, um, all of us will be on mute uh, until we are unmuted by the, uh, by the administrator to ask questions, if we have questions. Uh, we invite you to put your questions in the chat. Uh, and your questions will be administered um, from the chat by Reverend uh, Sean Roberts. And so those are our particulars uh, for today. And uh, just to remind you again that uh, on our last session next week, at the end of the last session, we will uh, conduct a, uh, a sort of an information gathering campaign, if you will, so that you can tell us uh, how to continue uh, to bring to you conversations that uh, we all need. And so we thank you for that. Um, and uh, that's the end of my comments. And we're going to turn it over to Dr. Allen and Dr. Jensen. And God bless us all. Okay, good morning to everyone. Um, I hope that we will be encouraged as we go through this second session about the real CRT, not the polemical one, but the real one. And today's theme is intersectionality. Now, in the literature of critical race theory, it means that people are more than just one social dimension. For example, 
people are more than their so-called race background. They are more than just their gender or we would say sex characteristics or sex background. They are more than their social class background. They are fathers. They may be police. They may be generals. They may be professors. So the idea of intersectionality is that people have many intersection points or aspects to their personality and that we cannot just reduce them to one identity, to one role, to one status. Now, it seems to me that what I want to get across today to unpack this, and our professor, Professor Jansen will talk about other aspects of it, but the way that I'd like to talk about it today briefly is that I'd like to flip the script. When uh, Reverend Feimster started to talk to me about critical race theory back in the summer, I was not interested. In fact, the first conversation that I gave with him was, well, let's approach it the way a scholar would approach it. And that would be, well, what's uncritical race theory? If you don't like critical race theory, there must be something that is different. And so I want to talk to you about an essay I wrote to him called A Legacy of Uncritical Race Theory. And although I may talk about a particular political party, I'm not fascinated by either political party or the politics of the United States. One of the things in my career, I'm a global scholar, uh, looking at Daniel II, the rise and fall of nations. So the particularities of one particular nation don't impress me. So I just would like to say that uh, I'm gonna say some things that might ruffle some feathers, but I want you to think about the vantage point. One of the issues that we have in this, the, the term intersectionality is, at what vantage point are we talking about? What's the perspective that people bring? So that's the first thing. I have an essay that I will read. Secondly, I want to talk about CRT and unmasking injustices. Then I'd get a little scholarly fun. I have this session called implausible digression, meaning the way that people talk about it, the polemical debate. And it just so happens that the very at the time that we finished last week's session, that I got a letter from the Heritage Foundation about critical race theory. So I decided, well, let me plug that in. Let's see what other people are saying about critical race theory. And that's the implausible digression. Then I'm going to talk about where do we move from here? Yes, we've had one session to talk about. CRT, we have in the second section talking about intersectionality, but where do we go from here? So I have a little system that I'd like to share in, in, in pre preparation for next week. And then lastly, uh, I think that whenever you engage the, the covenant community of God, the Lord, the church, uh, that the idea that Martin Luther King Jr. had of the beloved community, or if you are Hebrew, the shalom community. What does that look like? What is shalom? It's not just simple absence of conflict. What's the fulfillment of the kind of community that God has? And so we want to start, that's next week. I'm shading into next week, but I'd like to at least introduce some of the ideas and the concept. Before we begin though, what are some scriptures that can relate to this idea of intersectionality? If I were teaching at Wheaton, these are the ones that I use to talk about the topic. Number one, Psalm 139, 14 says, I will praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. And it goes on to talk about the works of God and how he delights in the works of God. And that tells me that no matter when I encountered a human being, they, they have multiple statuses. They are not just their their skin color or phenotype. They're not just their genotype. They're not just their, their role as a, as a teacher or a professor or a woman or a man or even the LGBTQ community. They're, I mean, there's diversity. And I always like to think, uh, I'm a Star Trek fan, and Star Trek has one crazy idea that I think really is biblical. It is that God sees things as infinite diversity an infinite combination. God is not surprised by diversity. God is not surprised by intersectionality. 
We humans might be surprised, but I don't think he's intimidated. He allows it. He doesn't vaporize people because they do crazy things. He doesn't vaporize people because they have a different identity than what I expect. So this intersectionality concept, it seems to me, is a is an example of what David talked about when he says, I am, and other people are fearfully and wonderfully made. But let's not stop there. In Acts chapter 10, verses 34 and 35, Peter, who had ethnocentric tendencies, he goes to Cornelius, a Roman centurion, the enemy, and he says, truly I perceive that God is not a respecter of persons. But in every ethnic group, in every family group, in every nation, those who fear him and do what is right are acceptable to him. Wow. You mean to tell me that the intersectionality of a Roman centurion is okay with God as long as he fears him and he does what is right? Wow. And that's the whole spread of the gospel had to deal with issues of intersectionality between the Greeks and the Hebrews, between the Romans and the, the, the church at Antioch. So the whole notion of intersectionality is not a new idea for biblical Christians, for people who really know the word of God. The problem is that with racism and ethnocentrism, slavery, colonialism, the church has been blinded from its own understanding of intersectionality. Thirdly, Paul went to Athens. This is my favorite. I want to read this. I went to Athens. It's because Paul went there. Paul addresses Mars Hill, the Areopagus, if you will. And he tells them about, you know, the ignorance of them worshiping the unknown God. But I, Paul says, I have come here to declare that God to you, God who made the world and everything therein. He does not exist in temples made by people. But he goes to say he has made of one blood, of one family, of one ethnic group, all the nations of humankind. Wow, that's real deep intersectionality. You mean to tell me there are no superior or inferior races? If they all came from the same source, how can one be superior to another? So the idea that people come in multiple colors, multiple statuses, multiple roles, that's not the issue. The real issue is that they came from a common ancestor and that they all need redemption. They all need salvation. They all need truth. They all need love. That's the intersectionality of the fruit of the spirit. Then we have this idea in 1 Corinthians 2, 1 through 16, that the natural man or the natural woman cannot perceive the things of God. It's ironic to me that the intersectionality that's talked about in Scripture is not perceived well by the world. And so the fact that God allows people in the world to be trying to engage this topic really is, I think, an indictment on the church because we have the Spirit of God. The Spirit of God is the, is the author of diversity. The Spirit of God is the author of forgiveness. The Spirit of God is the author of, of empathy. The Spirit of God is the author of love and compassion. So if anybody ought to be people who engage intersectionality, you would expect the true people of God, the true remnant of God to be engaged. First Corinthians 10, the whole passage that we have to learn from the examples, the mistakes of the Old Testament, that God has not given us a trial that's not, that's not common to human beings, but he's given us a way of escape. And the way of escape is his truth. The way of escape is his love. The way of escape is his redemption. The way of escape is his forgiveness. And then lastly, I wrote a seminar in my last year at Wheaton College for the spiritual formation or spiritual a Christian education program, it was called then. And it was called Success in Action. What is the basic law of success? The Lord says, do not be deceived, or Paul wrote rather, do not be deceived. God is not mocked for whatever a man or woman sows, that is what they also will reap. I believe that's the same principle of Proverbs 14, 34, for a nation. Whatever a nation sows, 
That is what they're going to reap. Now, you have an alternative. You can sow to the flesh or the sarks or the lower nature, or you can sow to the spirit. And then he says in verse 9, and don't be weary in doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not faint, as we therefore have opportunity, let us do good to all people, panta, all people, but especially those of the household of faith. So the idea of intersectionality is a diverse way of understanding God's people, understanding God's love, understanding God's creation. When we engage in racism, ethnocentrism, xenophobia, that is very much the opposite of the intersectionality that God talks about. So let me read my essay, if I can, and I'm, you know, I'm always pressed for time. This is what I wrote to Reverend Feimster back in July. Uncritical race theory and the Republican fears of truth. As a sociologist who has lived in the United States for nearly seven decades, I find it very disingenuous that so many conservatives and Republicans display maniacal furors and vituperative backlash over the teaching of critical race theory. What are they afraid of? Perhaps it is the unvarnished truth about the United States, the unmasking of white supremacy, and a legacy of inhumane brutality epitomized in systemic racial injustices. For the record, all social actors who have engaged in abject criminality desire to sanitize the accurate truth in such a way as to disguise their culpability. In my years, I have been victimized repeatedly by the lies and subterfuge of uncritical race theory. It started in kindergarten when I was taught to pledge allegiance to a society that had enslaved and oppressed my ancestors with reckless abandon. I was kept ignorant of the truth by overemphasizing the liberty and equal justice promised historically to all citizens, as well as by concealing the perpetual criminal atrocities against African Americans, meaning kidnapping, slavery, rape, oppression, gratification, and injustice. I was taught to review the so-called founding fathers without any accurate assessment of their white supremacy. I was taught to embrace a flag whose symbolism was deflated by the realities of segregation and humanity, racism, political, I mean, police brutality, white ignorance, and the hegemony of cacistography, meaning a ruler by the less competent. I was taught across elementary and high school to offer my life to defend a nation that had never been held account for its criminality against African Americans and others. My father was a soldier, wanted me to go to West Point. Uh, so I was drilled, flag boy, patrol boy, the whole nine yards. So I understand that kind of mentality. Uh, I, for this unrepentant populace, sincere restitution has been a perpetual farce albeit a rhetorical sham. Such are the lessons imbibed from uncritical race theory. Thankfully, the deep, pivotal biblical insights shared by the Apostle Paul has enlightened my journey. Meaning when Paul says, when I was a child, I thought as a child, I acted as a child, but when I became a mature man or a mature human being, I put away childish things. These are the childish things of America. Perhaps this uncritical race theory is what politicians and their ilk wish to cover up indefinitely in this country and worldwide. But they are too late to suppress the truth. Sociologists and historians have already opened up the Pandora's box of atrocities targeted against peoples of colors under the rubric of racist Confederate thinking and chronic denialism. Across the decades of my socialization, I was taught and incentivized to ignore or downplay hostile racialized violence, economic deprivation, housing discrimination, educational inequality, biased employment opportunities, informal types of discrimination, and all forms of inequity 
caused by a populist brainwash by an atmosphere of uncritical race theory. Fast forward to the 21st century, where uncritical race theory has visibly exploded exponentially via the clouds of corruption in government, media, policing, and other social domains. Lies, damn lies, and racism pervade state government, criminal justice systems, Republican jingoism, and, in, and inexcusable permutations of white backlash. Surely, uncritical race theory has been immensely successful in the gross ignorance typifying the Trump era. Right now, the insanity of stupidity has infected Republican stalwarts and their staunch allies in society. Yet, no social system can thrive or survive a perpetual stupidity epidemic. The sinister, the sinister progeny of uncritical race theory. That's the essay that I wrote. And why is it important? Well, I told you that right after last week's session, I got a letter from the, the, the Heritage Foundation. And because of time, and I went over time last time, I won't read it all, but I'll just say a few things as quickly as possible here. This is from, they think because I taught at Wheaton College that I'm a white evangelical. Uh, that's a big mistake that they made, but that's what they think. It says, dear fellow conservatives, critical race theory has taken our nation by storm. For a long time, it has been mostly isolated to colleges and universities, but in recent years, it has invaded our K-12 schools, workplaces, state and federal governments, and even the military. There's a good chance that you or your children have encountered it, and there's an even better chance that you didn't recognize it. That's because critical race theorists are really good at disguising their indoctrination. They use words like diversity, equity, and inclusion because those words sound harmless. And it can be easy to, for busy citizens, especially parents, to overlook such items. But those words have become key indicators of critical race theory, and they are not the only ones. That's why I'm sending you this email. And the rest of the email is about a little book pamphlet that they have that's going to explain uh, critical race theory, five ways you can stop it, four practical things you can do to stop it. I mean, this is the kind of thing. Now, you saw all the slides I used last week. Uh, that's a tall order to be able to do that in five steps and so forth. But here we go. I included it in the PowerPoint, and I hope that uh, the IJF, the Institute for Justice Foundation, or Larry, or whoever the sponsors are, will put it so that everybody can use it. My PowerPoints are for everybody. I don't claim intellectual property. This is sort of rec recreational thinking, so anybody can have it if they would like. But what are the elements of uncritical race theory? First of all, fear. I've got to make you scared. You may not understand critical race theory, but I have to make you afraid of it. Now, what, why is that a problem? The scripture clearly says, 2 Timothy 1.7, that God has not given us a spirit of fear. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and in the old King James, I think it says, of a sound mind. Well, I've changed that. Forgive me, my heresy. I like the movie, of a beautiful mind. So God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and of a beautiful mind. Every one of us, not just some who have high test scores, but everybody has a beautiful mind, okay? Second, uncritical race theory is based on hysteria. They want to cause a moral panic. In many ways, it's a moral pimping. They pimp off of people's ignorance. What people don't know, they create this bugaboo, this demon, if you will. Thirdly, they take advantage of the ignorance of people. They use deception. They use misinformation. They use disinformation. They use sophistry. They use un unqualified leaders, uh, people who are coaches, who know nothing about the government, and, and so forth. They use a lot of these kinds of people as their emissaries, as their false apostles. And then finally, if you go to Matthew 23, 
it says that wicked leaders or perverse leaders, the, the Sanhedrin of Christ's time, they strain a gnat to swallow a camel. What do I mean by that? They are totally indifferent to the truth, indifferent to love, indifferent to the beautiful mind. They are just indifferent for their own political or ideological purposes. Back in July, before all this hoo-ba-ba or this furor over CRT, uh, there was the guy uh, on uh, the, the the Black News Channel, which is the second the second year. It's a new innovation uh, on TV, and he basically came up with with three principles that I think are relevant to what we're doing here. First of all. He says that the critics of CRT, Dr. Mark Lamont Hill, let me give due credit to him, July 21st, 2021 telecast. He said, critics of CRT universalize CRT. They make it the bugaboo of everything. Everything is CRT. Diversity is CRT. Inclusion is CRT. Love is CRT. Race is CRT, and so forth. And so they create this great bugaboo, this great monster, if you will, to scare people. That's the spirit of fear. Secondly, they demonize CRT. They want to create a moral panic. They say that all CRT is Marxism, the great bugaboo of the 20th century, or it's Antifa, or it's left wing, something great, which is not true. Anybody who examines the case, there's a diversity of thought in CRT, just like there's a diversity of thought on the Bible. There's a diversity of thought on almost everything. Lastly, I, this is what I really appreciate about what he said. They create a solution in search of a problem. The solution is let's be anti-CRT before we even know there's a problem. There is no CRT taught in public school. So it seems to me it's idiotic to act as if it's true. It's not true. They don't teach CRT. They hardly teach it at undergraduate level. And in fact, a few law schools can't even teach CRT. It, as you listened to my talk last week, you see it takes a little bit of intellectual maturity and an intellectual facility to understand what it's about in the first place. So they try to incite white fears, stoke white supremacy, stoke white backlash. They use CRT as a wedge issue. That, to me, is not the kind of character you see from the people of God. So what do we know about? Uh, uncritical race theory, first of all, it focuses on omissions, second, on deceptions, thirdly, on inaccuracies, and fourthly, it's basic to support somebody's ideology, somebody's trying to get over on you. In many ways, it's like criminals, the pimps, drug dealers. They do things, they, they give you a, a, a straw man or something to distract you from the real issues or to cause you to be addicted to something that's not good for you. We are people of the beloved community, but in order to reach the, the beloved community, we have to test or assess things. When you go to the doctor and I say there's something wrong with me, the first thing the doctor is gonna to wanna to do, and I've done it many times, blood work. I hate blood work, okay? I hate being pricked all the time, stuck or whatever, but I realize that in order for the doctor to get an accurate diagnosis of what's happening with me, he needs to test. He needs to assess where I am. And he doesn't need to just assess the visible aspect. He needs to know what's going on and what, what he can't see. So there's assessment. But then there's diagnosis. Then there's treatment and intervention, something that I could do. And finally, to see if my treatment or my intervention is effective, there's always evaluation. There's a circle, a feedback loop. I have to constantly try to continually improve, get better and better at what I do. So, you know, the Bible says that the sins of the father are, or the mothers are passed on to the third and fourth generation. When I think of the society, when I think of the world, I think in four generational cycles. So my exercise is that if we're going to do an analysis, if we're going to do testing, if we're going to do an assessment, let's look at these four generational cycles. Assessing the United States, look at its unresolved problems, its unresolved 
uh, complications. And this is an exercise for you to do with small groups, for a class, for friends, for yourself or whatever. What are the big issues? I'm simplifying as a sociologist. Well, what has happened in diversity or with respect to CRT? Let's say that a generation is instead of 40 years, what it is in the Bible, let's shorten it to 20 years. So four generations times 20 years, the last 80 years. And what happened eight, as a generation before that, 160 years, and, uh, 12 times 20 and 16 and so forth. The issue is, let's look back and let's look, are there unresolved issues related to diversity, CRT, or difference that go across the generation? Are there unresolved issues of meaning? The meaning of race in the church, the meaning of gender in the church, the meaning of truth in the church, the meaning of, of, of what it means to be spiritually formed in the church. How those meanings change for good or for bad? How they're unresolved? Communications. You can't talk about our world without talking about social media. Social media brings out the worst of the best and, and the best of the worst. Okay? That's what social media does. It's, it's more confused than ever. Well, that's the fact that you have to deal with that. That's a communication issue. And then finally, consciousness. How does the world that we live in affect people's stress, the consciousness, their sense of self, their sense of self-worth, their sense of self-efficacy, and so forth? Those are big issues. Now, the church, I think, the church is in the love business, so it should be concerned about uh, diversity. The, the church is in the truth business, so it should be concerned about meaning. The church is in the communications business. It talks about the gospel. And Paul talked about the taking captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. So communications is important. And surely, I hope, the church is in the consciousness business because it talks about creating new redeemed human beings, a beloved community, that you are a, a chosen people, a new nation. There should be something new about this community. Well, it seems to me that if you're going to start doing something, about CR, what CRT talks about, you've got to have an accurate assessment, an accurate diagnosis. Now, you can add to this. You can change it. There's no love. There's no uh, uh, copyright associated with this. But use the template to figure out what do you need to do? Well, you need to assess what's going on before you can move on. I, added, I took this. Uh, this is a template from good old Microsoft. And I added my little specifics into it. But they end with, I think, something very interesting. The way to get started is to quit talking and begin doing. Whatever you might think of Walt Disney, you have to admire the, the grace that God has given him to move from some crazy cartoons into a worldwide empire. It seems to me that we should do him one better. If anybody needs to stop, quit talking about CRT, and straw man and all that crazy stuff and begin doing what the gospel actually says. I mean, the church is very good at talking a good game, but there's a difference between talking a good game and playing one. I'm sure you've heard people who critique quarterbacks. Oh, they should have thrown that interception or whatever, but they have never had six foot eight alignment who could, who could run the hundred of the four coming at them. All of a sudden, it's one thing to talk a good game, but can you play the game? It's time for the church to learn not to talk against CRT, but can you play the game as good or better than CRT? Thank you. I hope that they make this PowerPoint available to everybody. As well, last week, this is my free gift to the church. Thank you so much, Dr. Allen, for challenging us again. Uh, and for challenging the church specifically uh, in this context. Uh, we will now um, hear from Dr. Jensen, and uh, after Dr. Jensen's uh, response, uh, we will then uh, begin to entertain your questions uh, that I hope you are placing in the chat. So thank you again, and Dr. Jensen, we're ready to hear from you. Thank you. And Thank you, Dr. Allen, for this um, brilliant 
um, throwdown, if you will, <laughs> for all of us to, um, to take into account, um, to, to self-evaluate <laughs> where we are in the world and, and what it means to be who we are. So I wanna start with intersectionality. <laughs> we, all, we all come to the world with a variety of lenses, lenses we may or may not be aware of. And most of the time, those lenses are helpful to us. Sometimes they are not. Uh, think, of, think of the time you put on someone else's glasses and what you saw through them uh, just confused you. Um, when, when we pick up someone else's glasses, we see the world through their perspective. And part of our role as people of faith is begin to begin to learn to take perspective and not just to rely on what we take in. Let me, let me um, <laughs> name that for, for a portion of the population. That's what we call white privilege. The privilege of not seeing what we'd rather not see because we don't have to. Nothing has forced us to, right? Recognizing that um, that we that we perceive the world in a certain way, and if it's not a problem for me, then it must not be a problem. That is a lie. And because we can't see it, we don't know it's there. It's easy to be blinded to that reality. <laughs> for people of faith, I'm um, we are not permitted to live. It is, it is an imperative of our faith that we engage the truth. So what is truth? To, uh, <laughs> to take a quote from Pilate, <laughs> what is truth? With truth sitting right in front of him, he asks, what is truth? If Pilate could look at Jesus right in front of him and still wonder what is truth. Is it any wonder that it is difficult for us to engage that same question, what is truth? So there are a couple of ways I'd like to approach this. <clears throat> I'm gonna start with some that relate to our faith. Um, I'm beyond, beyond being a scholar, I'm also a person of faith. I'm gonna start with those ideas and I'm gonna to move to some ideas that relate to my academic area, which is uh, education, Christian education. So let's start with, um, what did Jesus do when he encountered people who were different, right? What, what did he do? Um, well, let's, let's think of some of those situations. Um, let's think of, and, and please feel free to put in the chat as you brainstorm with me. Um, what did Jesus do when he encountered people who were different? Um, well, he encountered a Samaritan woman. Um, what did he do? He engaged her. He reflected with her. He treated her as a conversation partner, not someone to be directed. Um, he, he found in her that which was... Um, that which was beautiful. What did Jesus do when he encountered difference? Um, he encountered. Um, let, let's let's recall that he was at a <clears throat> at a particular place and encountered a woman who um, who asked for help, and his response uncharitably um, was that. He came to he came to his own people, right? And she rightly notes that his own people go way beyond what his perspective was. And yes, I am challenging Jesus to put on another pair of glasses. And as she did, when he opened his eyes to see her in front of him, he realized that she too was a child of God. For me, this reminds me that every time I try to draw a fence around who, who a child of God might be, 
I'm challenged again to move beyond it. That there is no fence, there is no edge to God's love. There is no edge to who is us. And ultimately, that's really what this is about. Race is a construct, it doesn't exist. God made people, along with lots of other things that God called very good. And when God made people, God didn't make particular kinds of people on different days. God made people. We come from the same place. We are the ones who have drawn those lines. What, what did Jesus do in his ministry? He encountered lots of people. He encountered people who thought they knew all the answers. Um, people like the Pharisees. What, what did Jesus do in regard to the Pharisees? How did he interact with them? We challenged their thinking. Um, people, who, people who thought they had, they had all the right answers. Jesus challenged their thinking. He challenged them to go beyond the right answers they believed they knew. Right? Um, Jesus encountered children. Um, children for whom society had no real place. You are on your way to being a functioning member of society. Until then, we'll let you live here. What did Jesus do? He brought them into the middle, into the center, a place that was reserved for people who were important. And in so doing, he changed how we think about who's important. All of this is about putting on different lenses, seeing differently understanding differently. And our imperative as people of faith is to do just that, to take next most faithful steps. Next most faithful steps. Great, you're faithful today, you're doing your best. None of us have permission to stop there. The call of our faith is to continue to grow in faithfulness. And that means next, most faithful steps. I'm always looking for where are the edges? Where are the places? How can I continue to grow? How can I continue to build an understanding? How can I, frankly, how can I continue to grow in love? We're told in the education field that emotion is a key to people um, to people learning things, um, that, that the opportunity to, to learn goes beyond just someone with knowledge. The opportunity to learn is, um, is, is, is eased, the path is smoothed by emotion. And so when I love my neighbor, I am more likely to learn about my neighbor, to engage my neighbor, to see their struggles. And frankly, when they tell me that the way we talk about history is hurtful, I am more likely to feel their pain. I am more likely to want to understand more. Loving my neighbor is about recognizing that when they say something has hurt them, and how could it not have hurt them? <laughs> the history of this nation, the history of our world, um, <clears throat> was littered with people who were deemed inconsequential. How can, how can I not, as a person of faith, hear that and be moved by it? and seek to change, to love more perfectly, more completely. So that's the, that's the perspective of faith I want to start with. <clears throat> when we hear people talk about um, history as that's just the way it was, we hear a perspective that allows us to um, that allows us to dismiss what might be painful. And as we, as we might be tempted to do that, 
as we might want to exercise white privilege and not deal with it. Um, this this, this um, dismissal, this, um, this fascination with ignorance enters in. <clears throat> ignorance is, I'm gonna say a poor excuse. Ignorance is, ignorance is just that. It's just an excuse for not dealing with a reality. And this fascination with or romanticism, I'm just a simple person kind of ignorance. God, God calls us to more. God calls us to next to most faithful steps. God calls us to grow. If, if, uh, if God calls us to grow in faith, God calls us to grow. <clears throat> I'm going to start with um, an understanding that learning begins with reality. And, and this goes back to how we understand um, our, even our reading of, of scripture. Um, most of us are not biblical scholars. Most of us do not read the scripture in its original languages. Most of us are not um, deeply engaged in the ancient culture of the Middle East, Palestinian culture. <clears throat> Most of us, um, we, we just don't have that as our background. And so we rely on scholars to help us to know that. Um, we might like the way the text sounds in English. Um, as we read it together, we might like to just expound on that. Um, but the reality is that there's a lot we don't understand about that text. And until we do understand it, until we have done the hard work of exegesis, of digging into what the context was like and what the author might have meant and what the readers or the hearers might have heard, even asking what kind of literature it is, how do we understand that kind of literature, the truth that's in it? How do we understand that truth? Without doing that hard work, um, we're left in a sort of ignorance, right? To be, to be assuming <laughs> that we can read the scriptures in English and understand them at face value. That we can rightly divide the word of truth, if you will, without, without digging in. When we, when we live with that sense of privilege, we do an injustice to the scriptures. It's the kind of injustice that we do by reading an uncritical understanding of history, not asking any questions about context, um, not asking how the how the people who were already in the land felt about being um, invaded, about God giving the land uh, to the Israelites, right? An uncritical reading allows us to live in a sense of ignorance. And, and that is not where God calls us to be. God calls us to, to live up to our potential. God calls us to do and be all that God has equipped and made us to be. So how do we do that? And I think the first, the first step is to, is to understand perspective. Until we recognize that, um, that we cannot possibly see the whole picture without seeing it through the eyes of others, without setting aside self-interest, and understanding through the eyes of others, um, then we have not done justice. If we do not recognize that um, ignorance is not an excuse, um, we have not done we have not done justice. We have not loved with our whole heart. If we allow our comfort. And let's face it, white privilege is a lot about comfort. It's a lot about um, not wanting to be, not wanting to recognize 
what my ancestors and others who look like me did. And you might say, you might dismiss it as, you know, they, they didn't know any better. Oh, <laughs> any better, any better. They just chose not to do better. Um, I'm gonna turn the page a little bit and talk about um, those pedagogical um, pieces. When we engage the scripture in, uh, in any real um, or just way, we do so through the lens of our own perspective. We also do, through, do that through the lens of many other perspectives. That's what intersectionality is about. Um, recognizing there are lots of ways. We, I, am, I am a lot of different things at once. And all of our perspectives together do help us to understand something. Pedagogically, this happens by, um, by bringing other perspectives into the text, into the room. Um, pedagogically, this happens by recognizing the multiplicity of stories that are told in any one story. Um, so let me offer this. Uh, most of us, when we study the scriptures, we study them in contexts that look like us. We study them in relatively monolithic contexts, um, homogeneous. So if that's the case, then how do we how do we get that perspective? Right? The, the typical congregation is relatively homogenous. The typical congregation is socially constructed around people who are alike. So how do we get that perspective? How do, how do I hear in the text what I naturally can't hear? I can rely on experts. I can rely on, um, on other people to help me know that. Um, but what if, I know this is crazy, what if we began to say, we cannot rightly understand the scripture unless we do so in a room that's not homogenous? What if I say, Bible study can't happen unless we're doing it in a context that's diverse, diverse in lots of ways, right? Um, so yes, there's some benefit to people of the same gender all studying scripture together, but there's a greater benefit uh, to doing to studying scripture in a diverse context. Yes, it's possible to study scripture as a context of people of the same race or social status, but how much better for us to read and understand scripture in a context that is more diverse. <laughs> what if we said an immodest proposal, what if we said, no more Bible study that doesn't include a diversity of perspectives, right? Um, the recognition that a change in perspective won't happen if we continue to do the same things. We're going to need to do something different. Pedagogically, um, the, the ways that we um, engage one another, um, and for education to happen, um, there must be some challenge, right? Um, education doesn't happen if I'm not challenged, if my ideas or preconceptions are not challenged. Um, but the other end of that spectrum is threat. And when challenge becomes so much that people feel threatened, they tend to lock their arms against it. And in education, we understand that probably a, a good way, a better way for education to happen is for people to encounter ideas that challenge them some, but not so much as to threaten. And, and that's great, but what that means for a change in how we understand, um, how we understand our context is many of us have been permitted to study the scripture without much challenge without much challenge as it relates to our perspectives on race, on a hundred justice issues, on socioeconomic status, right? 
And frankly, it may be time for some challenge that verges to threat. Um, for people to feel threatened is not a good thing, but I think we need to amp up the challenge. If we don't challenge ourselves and if we're not challenging uh, people, people with whom we study scripture, then we're not doing our job. Mm -hmm. um, let's talk about the role of hope in all of this. Um, because ultimately, um, dealing, with, dealing with difficult issues around um, all of the issues that intersect as a part of our social construct, dealing with those difficult issues can be, can be daunting, can feel like um, it, there's, there is no end. And frankly, it's taken us hundreds of years to get into the mess we're in. So it's probably going to take some time for us to get back out, to walk back out. Um, so, so hope is the thing that allows us to believe that it is possible for us to do better, to be better. Hope is key in education. When we hope, when we, when we engage in the audacious act of hope, we not only live into the scripture's call, um, God's desire for us, but we also um, allow ourselves to believe that real and genuine change can happen. That beloved community that Dr. King talked about, that, that Hank referred to, that beloved community is possible because we hope and because we act. In an educational context, the, the understanding that we can do and be better is why we keep trying. Right? Why we keep taking next most faithful steps. I think I'm going to leave it there. I think, I think we have some things that we can engage, that we can talk about. Um, and I want to give opportunity for, for conversation and for questions. I think I'll leave it there. Well, uh, Dr. Jansen, we appreciate uh, you coming in and sharing with us today. And of course, Dr. Uh, incredible. Um, once again, we thank you for your, your energy, your insight, your challenges, both of you, your challenges here. And uh, we, we do want to offer some time for questions. Uh, we are a little bit ahead of our schedule. So that's, that's good news. Uh, just want to remind everybody that that the way we are, we, are, we are moving forward is just to put your questions within uh, the chat and I will read those. Um, and then uh, uh, Dr. Jansen, Dr. Allen, if you guys wanna go back and forth with uh, each other too, we encourage that um, because there's a lot of insight, a, 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 lot, of, um, a lot for us to, to take in. Um, and we appreciate this. Just real quick, one of the questions that we had, uh, Dr. Allen, is that um, it says you, uh, your assertion to quit talking and start doing uh, is very insightful. However, what are your recommendations for meaningful action, especially in a world where everyone seems to want to lie first and then act upon those lies? That's next week's topic, next week's topic. <laughs> I'm not going to give it away today because there's a lot involved. Uh, I gave you a, a little chart to work on to start gathering your thoughts. But if I give you too much today, it will feel inundated. There are other things, there are other tools coming next week. And I just feel that uh, I am not going to give away the good stuff for next week. But there are, there are ways. The opposite of lies is to tell the truth. What we're doing here in this webinar is to come against all the crazy hysteria over CRT. 
I mean, people are blowing it out of proportion. And how someone can believe in an omniscient, omnipotent, and all seeing God, <laughs> omnipresent God, and be worried about CRT is amazing to me. How, as uh, Dr. Jansen talked about, how you can read Paul in 1 Corinthians 13 and says, these things abide, faith, hope, and love. The greatest of these things is love. And be worried about CRT really astounds me because it just reflects the low level of real understanding, biblical understanding, biblical interaction. And as Dr. Jansen talked about, community. The fact that we don't interact with one another, we we lose out. If, if you don't have a diverse community, even secular scholars, Scott Page wrote a book, he's a political scientist, called The Difference. Uh, even secular people recognize that if you don't have a blend of people, that whatever you do is going to be less significant, less innovative, than you would have a blend of of people with different perspectives. And it's not about IQ. It's not about all these fancy degrees. It's not about all that stuff. It's about body life. It's about community. It's about the beloved community. It's about love. And how we can beat yes. that business and be so naive about its practicality is astounding to me. Yeah, I, I absolutely. And and I it seems to me that a a lot of the, um, it seems to me one of the challenges that we seem to be facing or people that want the beloved community, people that want to, to work for justice is, is we have these groups of people that are highly organized pushing uh, this fight over critical race theory. So, you know, Dr. Allen, your letter, your letter, uh, I got a phone call. Uh, from somebody, a pastor from another state saying that we need to get organized, trying to get me to get organized about what's happening in Loudoun County. Well, I mean, how do we push back on that? I mean, th these are big groups that are organized. What's the first step, I guess? <laughs> uh, remember, uh, I think Belinda, one of the people from uh, John Lita sent me an email last week. And one of the things that we have to start doing is realize the significance of God's remnant, R-E-M-N-A-N-T. He's not impressed. He can, slay, he can say with the few or the, or the little. Uh, he's not impressed by their money. He's not impressed by their status, their power, their connections. His truth is bigger than all of that. What we have to do is to be faithful to the truth. My favorite story in the Bible is David versus Goliath. Now, you know that Goliath had everything going for him. The Philistines were the bigger, the badder, the better. Israel was afraid of them until David showed up and said, how dare this uncircumcised Philistine try to challenge the armies of the living God? We need a little bit of that spirit in what we deal with but we're not dealing physical weapons. I'm not going to throw a spear at the Heritage Foundation. I'm not going to draw a nuke. I'm still on Trump. They send me, because they think I'm a white evangelical, they send me all this Trumpism, all this crazy Hillsdale comedy. They send all that junk to me. I'm not going to, I'm not going to try to explode them, but I am going to use, as Paul says, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal in nature, but powerful for the demolishing of strongholds. You can see, I'm going to use that intellect, that spirit, the power of my person, the power of my actions with that remnant and do everything I can all over the world to strengthen those remnant communities who are actually living the way God wants. He deals with the rest of these folks. I just do. I love them. I try to help them as they come to me. But my focus is on doing good, to the household of faith, the real household of faith, not the cultural, not the political, not the fancy, not the wealthy, but the real household of faith. 
Yeah, thank um, you. I, you know, I just want to say, I want to affirm um, that you have a voice. And when, when he calls you, asking you to align, you know, I appreciate your, I appreciate you, brother. I want to be, I want to be in, in relationship with you, but I just can't get with this, you know, using, using your voice and maintaining relationship. But every time we do nothing, we collude. Yeah. And I think that's a, that's the huge challenge to, um, to make sure that we just don't sit back. Yeah, and sometimes that is a challenge for, uh, for even people like me. Um, I want to get back to another question uh, uh, for you, Dr. Uh, Jansen. How, um, how can most local Bible studies continue with your call for being a team of greater diversity? <laughs> mm -hmm. A lot of us are not diverse, the churches that we are part of in Bible studies. Mm -hmm. Right, and I recognize it's a process, and I recognize that. Um, so, so I think it starts with white folks got to do white folks' work. Our work is to unmask. Our work is to look at things we have not had to look at. Our work is to acknowledge <laughs> and to continue to ask the deeper questions. Right, and. And there is no end to that. And the second piece of that is, it is not the responsibility of people of color, BIPOC brothers and sisters, to teach us stuff, right? It is not the responsibility of the black church down the road to be in relationship with us. It is our opportunity to learn from one another, but there is no obligation, right? So, so that said, how, how do we engage people across, um, across streets we don't tend to cross, right? And, and, and that is challenging. It is challenging because it took centuries for us to get into this mess. And there is no quick way to get out of it. But a long faithfulness in the right direction, in the direction of truth. Um, that's, how we, that's how we do this. Many of the time, many times we, we get distracted, we get on a, we get on a jag <laughs> and, and we're all about what diversity, um, intersectionality, we're all about um, studying scripture in diverse contexts until there's something else, right? But what we're called to is, is long, hard work. It's gonna take a long time. So how do we, how do we engage? Um, well, <laughs> there, are, there is Bible study material that's available um, published by other kinds of publishing houses from other perspectives, actively seeking those other perspectives. <clears throat> There's, there is work done by scholars um, who bring <laughs> into your midst a gift of another perspective, right? Um, maybe it goes beyond <clears throat> Bible study guides we've historically used to studying to reading a book together, um, to try to broaden our perspective, to open our eyes a little bit. Um, maybe it involves <laughs> engaging, creating a community forum, engaging beyond ourselves. Um, <clears throat> I'm gonna cough, so I'm gonna stop there. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it, that, that tends to uh, sometimes get in the way. So we understand, please, please uh, take your time. I, I think one of the things that we do also see is, is the technology that's kind of been forced upon us opens up doors for us. I mean, how many, you know, think about would this conference even be possible in the way it is without, without Zoom? We are connecting people from different parts of the country. And I think that's, uh, that's important. 
Uh, you guys are doing a great job with putting in the questions. I appreciate that. Um, uh, I'm trying to uh, to look at all of these here. Um, what can be done to highlight the church's historic role in racism and how can churchgoers uh, skeptical of systemic racism become engaged? Put that for um, John, I have taught, what, almost 40 years at Wheaton, almost every decade, somebody has written something about racial and ethnic differences. There are books, there are magazines, there are movements, uh, and, but they peter out. Um, so I think that it, it seems to me, as uh, I think Denise or Dr. Jensen was talking about, you have to start where you are. Uh, when I was, uh, what, my first couple of years of teaching at a Christian college, there was a book by a, a, a anthropologist named Tom Hopler. It was called A World of Difference. It was published in a varsity press. And it even, it, it was so, it, let me give you, Tom Hopler was an anthropologist that went to Kenya and used, was a missionary. I mean, went out, you know, did the, the, trying to missionary sort of role and so forth. But he became convicted when he came back to the States. I think it was either Newark or Camden. And he saw the same kinds of problems here in the States. And so he said, look, I see differences in Kenya or in Africa, I see the same kind of differences here. I see the church is more interested in the issues in Kenya and Africa than just a few miles from the church where I came back. There's something wrong with that. So he wrote this little, it's a practice, it's not a scholarly, it's, it's, it's really sort of mainstream, uh, ordinary folk called the world of difference. Years later, it was so successful that university published a companion guide uh, to a little questionnaire and Bible study kind of thing that people could use. And that was very successful for a while. I thought it was going to continue on. Uh, there are, I've worked with uh, Moody Bible Institute. I've written articles for them on these issues. I've published things with Erdman's uh, and the evangelical world and all of that. So there are things out there uh, there, uh, there's a list, uh, uh, doc, uh, Dr. Feimster and the IJF knows that when I talk to his class, I give at least 67 different references across the, the, the years on this topic. I think that as leaders, the leaders and the people in the congregation have to get together. It's going to take faith, hope, and love. It's going to take some learning, but it's also going to take some risk, meeting new people, developing new communities. It's going to take some love. So it's not something that you can just do poof, like magic is going to happen. That's ridiculous. I have belonged to multiracial congregations. When I was at the secular university of Rochester, I belonged to a assembly of God's church that was one third Anglo, white, whatever, one third Hispanic and one third black. The unity was the unity of the spirit. That is the closest I have felt to the beloved community in my entire Christian life of 54 years. Now, I don't know what's happened when I left university. I was there for about seven, eight years or whatever. But uh, I said to myself, it's possible. I have visited other uh, congregations uh, in Minneapolis, the uh, Park Avenue United Methodist Church. I've worked with people on those issues back in the day. And so I had been both to homogeneous churches as well as to diverse, multiracial, multiethnic churches. And it seems to me they have common problems, but a lot of it depends on the leadership, the spirit of innovation. Last week, somebody asked me, what do we do? I said, you have to study your church. You have to know where your churches are. Some churches are taking baby steps. To them, to have somebody different is a radical thing. Well, that's a different kind of curriculum and a different kind of program than somebody that's multiracial, multiethnic, engaged with the city or whatever there used to be. And when I was a student at Wheaton, uh, I forgot, it was, uh, it was a church on, on the north side of Chicago, uh, LaSalle Street. Uh, when I was a young student, I belonged to that. It was multiracial, multiethnic, 
It was a church that built a housing complex for the poor in the city near the Cabrini Green area. So there are churches like that. We don't have a lot of good information. There are books about some of those things. That's not my area. I mean, yes, I'd like to do that because Sam, Dr. Feemster, is my friend. But I deal with issues at a much higher level. There are much higher intellectual area uh, issues in the world than the kinds of things that people in America deal with. Yes, I'm concerned about these issues, but these are not the most important issues affecting the whole planet, okay? There are, some, there are things that I can't even talk to you about here. But we need to take whatever steps, and I think uh, Dr. Jansen, uh, Dr. Feimster, uh, Larry, uh, and, and Sean, all of you are given the opportunity to do the Antioch thing. Be the church of Antioch. Okay, that's all I'm saying. Thank you. Uh, if we could get some help with unmuting uh, Dr. Jansen, that would, she's ready to speak, but she can't seem to, to unmute. And while, while we're waiting, one of the, <laughs> there right. she is, wonderful, <laughs> wonderful. Um, yeah, so, so um, yes, everything Hank said, and the world is so much bigger. And, and so how is it that we don't know any people to be in conversation with, right? Has this, has this ever become a question? Like, how do I not know people to be in conversation with? How do I not know people um, that I might engage um, personally? How, how did I get to this place, right? And, and how do I get back out? Um, I think, I think it depends on the person, it depends on the context, but doing something, right? To put yourself in a place that gives you the opportunity to engage people with different perspectives. Um, it takes getting out of your comfort zone. It takes, it takes stepping out of where, what you've always done, where you've always been. Um, and that, you know, there's just no, there's no substitute for putting yourself in another place. Um, so that you can engage. I agree the virtual world helps a ton to be in conversation with people uh, whose perspectives are different and frankly it gives us the opportunity to be in conversation with people all across the world. Now there still are some disparities. Not everybody's going to have bandwidth to, to do a Zoom conversation like this, <clears throat> but it gives us opportunity and so um, where the excuse has previously been, <laughs> the, the joke is told, um, the excuse previously was that we didn't have access to information. That's why, that's why there was ignorance on, on important issues. Now we have the internet and there is lots of access to information and we still have ignorance. So I guess access wasn't the issue, right? So how do we understand um, that the issue is not access? The issue is not that we don't have a way of engaging other people. The issue is something else. I would just say, Denise, there are multiple levels of ignorance. <laughs> <laughs> Very true. <laughs> well, I, I just, I'm looking at my shelf over here. Uh, back in the day, Moody Press put, uh, put together a book called Building Unity in the Church. And it's about these kinds of issues, diversity, mm -hmm. I think it was published maybe uh, over a decade ago. They published it. Uh, there's a, a second book about r winning the race to unity that uh, I participated in. Uh, so there are books out there. There, there one uh, by Foster about embracing diversity in the church. I, I just think that maybe one thing you could do is have uh, people, uh, young people in your church put together some kind of study guide, some kind of bibliography, and let the people of the church decide how they want to learn, how they want to do. I, I think even the Institute for Justice Fellowship with uh, Dr. Feimster and trying to get churches together to talk about issues of justice or whatever. You have to create this on your own. You can look at what other people have done, but this is unique to you. This is a unique Kairos moment for this group. And I'm waiting to see 
what this group will do. Listen to the Holy Spirit. I, I want to lift up just one other resource. Um, and it's a little self-serving, but I did uh, develop a curriculum with um, some colleagues um, to go along with the National Council of Churches United Against Racism resource. Um, we created a facilitator's guide, and that's a helpful tool for congregations that want to begin to encounter these things. Um, it is not, it does not get you all the way there, <clears throat> but it, it helps you to take some, some first steps. I also want to note in the chat, uh, Letitia Lee has identified several great resources. Letitia is one of our students at the School of Theology and, um, and a fabulous scholar in her own right. Um, the Color of Compromise. Um, there's, there's a number of really good books that are going to challenge. And, and I think um, looking for those resources, I can give you some others um, in the chat. We can, I'm sure Hank has them too. We can, we can offer other suggestions. If what you want to do is engage a book, um, I would say that is, that is one thing you can do, but don't let it be a substitute for engaging actual human beings. What um, what is the role of the black church in all of this? That the question that came up. I think that's an important question. Um, there was a book that was written many years ago before the civil rights movement by a guy named Kyle Houseden. He was a Methodist minister from South Carolina, and he wrote a book called "The Racial Problem in Christian Perspective." I think it was 58, 59. He said this, until black people in the church feel secure about their status in the United States, they are not going to move away from the dominant model of the black church. The black church is a place of security, a place of networking, a place of uh, peace, uh, a place of relaxation away from the rigors of what it means to be black in society. So if we don't solve the love problems or the beloved community problems in society, you can forget about uh, eliminating the black church. The black church is a reflection. It's a positive reflection because God doesn't do everything in the same way. There are positive roles for predominantly black churches. There are positive roles for predominantly white churches. I, it's, it's not the whiteness. It's the ignorance that's the problem. It's the lack of engagement. Uh, so it seems to me that you're going to have a diversity of forms. The question is, what's the maturity? What is the outreach? What's the compassion? Whatever the composition of the church. And it seems to me the Holy Spirit of God doesn't give any church an excuse. Whether you're homogeneous, whether you're heterogeneous, whether you're immigrant church, whether you're multicultural. I went to Times Square Church in in, uh, in New York City, Manhattan. Uh, I was doing a gig for the American Bible Society for several years. They have over 120 different languages represented in that church. It was a Pentecostal church, but it's the most multicultural church I have seen. And I said to myself, you know, God, the Holy Spirit works in that church and he works in some of these homogeneous, I've done storefront churches, I've done predominantly white churches. I've been involved in rural churches. I'm a sociologist, so we get to see the whole thing. But I would say that it, 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 the same imperative to love, to present the gospel, to preach good news to the poor, release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, set at liberty all who are oppressed, proclaiming the acceptable year of the Lord's favor is for all churches. Some do it well. Some do it not so well. Remember, and I'll close, we have the seven churches, Revelation 1 through, 1 through 3, chapters 1 through 3. You see that they're, even though they're diverse churches, they had different problems. They had different levels of maturity. They had different wisdom or whatever. Uh, and it seems to me that you're always going to have that in the church world, whether human, homogeneous, heterogeneous, or a mixture. The problem is, what are you doing to demonstrate the love of the gospel to everybody on the planet? Yeah. So I, I can't speak to the role of the black church. 
but I'm going to say what it's not. <laughs> the Black church's job is not to teach us all how to get along. The Black church's role is not to um, tell us, to point out our, our issues. Um, the, the white white folks on the call, <laughs> um, that, is, that is not the role of the Black church. <clears throat> the Black church exists um, because of some of these very same issues we're talking about today. The division is not black folks making churches. The division is how white folks treated them. I jumped the gun. I jumped the gun a little bit on, on people's questions. Do you guys, Dr. Allen and Dr. Jansen, have kind of questions of each other in response to each other's uh, um, presentations? Are there other pieces that you would like to speak to? And we'll continue to take questions within the chat. Dr. Ellen, you, you taught for a long time at uh, Wheaton College. I'm curious what your experience was teaching there as a person of color. I taught at a university before going to Wheaton. My experience at Wheaton, I was bored. <laughs> it was not much of a challenge. I missed the university. Had the Holy Spirit not directed me in that direction, there's no way I would have gone to Wheaton College. I felt like Jonah going to Nineveh. I mean, this was a place that was less sophisticated, more homogeneous, more Republican, more white upper middle class, and more boring than any place I would like to be in. Uh, so my experience, even though I was successful, I was the chair of the department for nine years, which was a record. Uh, you know, in the, our department, we went up to some of the highest enrollments or whatever. I just felt Wheaton was an old, archaic, institution that it reads its tea leaves. I mean, it's almost when you're a legend in your own mind, that's a very dangerous situation to be in. Uh, God does not need legends in their own minds. He, he moves in fresh ways. So to me, even though I was an alum, I went there, I did three years and two as an undergraduate. I found myself, I, I took the good things that God has for me there, but I couldn't wait to get away. And uh, as Satchel Page would say, once I left week, don't look back. I did look back. That was my experience. Now, everybody's not like that. But for me, uh, if you're a very talented, very smart uh, African-American, there's not much there for you. Other questions? <laughs> Everybody got quiet. You wonder what? <laughs> it, it's, it's a lot. All of it is a lot for uh, at least for me to take in. And, uh, and, and sometimes we need the silence to just absorb it all. Mm -hmm. I, I'm curious um, for, for Dr. Ellen, especially, um, as you think about intersectionality, what is the role of homogenous communities? Um, what's the role of the men's Bible study? What's the role of, you talked about the role of the black church, a homogenous community. What about some of these other homogenous communities? What do you think? I think God works in different ways. I don't expect God to have all the same kind of people, the same kind of thing. People have certain levels of maturity. Now, Dr. Jansen, I'm sure Pastor Roberts, you. You have people in your congregation that are at different levels. They, they have different experiences. There's not one size fits all. And so I would say for little rural churches that are homogeneous, I've even preached in some of those places. Uh, the idea is to be as prophetic in that church as you are in a large, wealthy, uh, 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 you know, uh, multicultural church. The, the, the mission is the same. The way people receive the mission is different depending on their circumstances. But as a believer, uh, the mission is the same. Uh, you just have to see what is God doing in the people? How can you help? How can you serve? How can you encourage? How can you build up? But the mission is the same all around the globe. 
let me just say, Acts 1A, the Lord told the disciples, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, to the uttermost parts of the earth. That's been my mission, wherever I am. That is the same mission I think we all have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good. We are not, we're not place bound, in other words. We're called to think, think globally. Mm -hmm. Cool. I think people can sometimes take comfort in a group that's more homogenous, but um, that same comfort is also um, an excuse. So not allowing ourselves, but our personal discipline, not allowing ourselves only to be in comfortable situations. I think there are times when there's benefit to uh, breaking into uh, homogenous groups with the intention of talking about unity and racism and these kind of things. I was part of um, People Supper uh, event that we hosted in Northern Virginia, trying to get people together around the table to talk about race and, and to, to have a conversation about this. Of course, COVID mixed it all up. <laughs> uh, but what we what we ended up doing was also providing places for uh, the different groups to be together so that we could deal with issues. The white people have some things that we need to deal with in the issue of race. And we need to have the place where we can talk about that and we can we cannot kind of burden people of color while we do that. There's some there's some pieces where we need to get together and say, look, we've got work to do. Uh, we need to own up. We need to kind of talk through some of the things that we need to do. And I think there is a role uh, to, to that. If, if, you know, we are intentional about uh, trying to, to um, tackle the issue as honestly and openly as we can. Um, but, my goodness, when it comes to Bible study, when it comes to engaging scripture, a deeper understanding, it is when I am with friends uh, from different backgrounds that can open up the scriptures to me with, with um, realities and th that I haven't seen before. And I, I do think that that's, that's important. That's important for me. It's important for me to sit with people who are different than me to, to see and understand and, and learn. Um, yeah. Uh, Dr. Jansen, um, is it pedagogically sound to have both homogeneous interactions as well as heterogeneous ones? There should be a balance between the two. Mm -hmm. We should be able to hear from homogeneous groups and we should be able to hear from heterogeneous groups without being fearful or about being insecure Whatever, because that's part of the learning process. What I have found is that in homogeneous churches, if they don't want to listen to diversity, God will send them problems. God will send them persecutions. God will send them COVID, or God will send them something they can't control, and they have to get off their rear end and engage something that's different. So a lot of this, what's happened to the American church, I am really happy about. Why? Because we were getting lazy, fat, prosperity, gospel, uh, you know, all that kind of stuff. And God said, wait a second. There is something, you know, it says in Hebrews that the Lord will shake the foundations of the church. Well, he says shaking the foundations of the American church. And right now, it's time for us to stand up and be counted. Who is on the Lord's side? Not just talk about it. Show up. Let's see it. And that's the challenge that we have today. Um, yes, to your question, absolutely. It's appropriate and important for people to be in situations where people are more like them in some perceived way and, and in diverse situations. I think where we fall down is we tend to like those comfortable situations more and so we do them more. And so... Um, rather than uh, pushing ourselves or allowing that to be a once in a while thing <laughs> and pushing our, ourselves more of the time. I think the other thing that's true is 
um, the way that power structures work in congregations. Some of those groups, I know I went there. Um, some of those groups <laughs> tend not to be just about studying the Bible. They allow the convergence of their various intersections um, to make those situations be places where decisions are made instead of recognizing the purpose of those contexts. Yeah. Just uh, to echo a question brought up for everyone, what are some things that are lingering? What are some things that you would like to know more about uh, covered uh, the past two times? We do have one more session, so we are going, uh, we're going to get to some of these things, but but be thinking about some things that may be lingering about today, uh, maybe that, that, that we'd like to have more information about, uh, or last week. And then how, uh, one question came in, how can we respond or interact with those in our church family who are promoting the kind of fear mongering that the Heritage Foundation is promoting? Sometimes uh, they're right, right there in our own churches, right there in the same pew. Absolutely. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let Hank address that first. Can I offer just one other insight um, to the point of why it's important to study the Bible in diverse contexts? So I was in a class a few years ago. I mean, most of the classes that I'm in, I'm the only person who's not a person of color in the room. And um, so I'm teaching a class and we're de dealing with a Bible text as a way of understanding um, particular curriculum uh, item. And the text was that uh, text from Numbers um, about lifting up the uh, serpent in the wilderness. And <clears throat> the the context is the Israelites are in the wilderness and, and they're fetching, they're grousing, niggling, right? And the, the scripture, the Bible study guide that we were using, the curriculum we were reviewing, um, posed this text from the perspective of these people were just complaining, a bunch of complainers, right? And I'm Okay, sounds reasonable. <laughs> Until one of the people in the room raised her hand and she said, a lot of times people who are raising issues of justice, who are crying out for justice, get dismissed as complainers. Mm -hmm. That's why to read a text in a diverse context. That's a perspective from a particular lens. And it's a lens that I didn't have. And so in that moment, very, very grateful for the gift that that student offered of perspective. Dr. Allen, there's a really big question for you here. I'm gonna to toss it to you. Okay. <laughs> can you reiterate, Sean? Yeah, sure. Um, How can we respond or interact with those in our church family who are busily, uh, Hang on a second, it just moved on me. <laughs> promoting the kind of fear mongering the Heritage Foundation is promoting. When these people are in our church, when they're sitting beside us, sometimes in the same pew, how, how do we respond or interact with those in our own church family that are going about this in a much different way? I, I, think, Paul, I think Paul said it best in Romans 12. At the end, verse 21, he says, do not be overcome by evil or stupidity, but be over overcome evil with good. You try to be loving and kind to those people who disagree with you, but you don't spend a lot of your time uh, trying to convert them. That's God's responsibility. My job is to just represent the truth as the Lord has taught me and to work with people who are trying to, believe, who, trying to build the beloved community. That's a full-time job. If you're trying to move toward the good, the Bible says quite clearly, prove all things. You know, documento, hold fast what is good, move away from that which is evil. And if you're trying to build the beloved community, you don't have time. You've already got your own issues you have to deal with. You're trying to serve your brothers and sisters. 
you're trying to serve your community where you work and so forth. You don't have time to get into a, a needless, bombastic battle with people. I always say, Lord, you created these folks. You created their minds. You created their bodies. That's your responsibility, okay? It's your, my responsibility is to love and serve to the extent possible, but changing them and dealing with them, that's your responsibility. And like I said last week, when the Lord was here, he sent out his disciples two by two. And he said, if you go into a community and your peace abides there, abide there, have fellowship, love it. But if you go into a place and your peace does not abide there, shake the dust off your feet and go to another town. I am not going to sit here, rack my brain, fall apart, fight, go to violence with somebody. That's the Lord's job. My job is to positively do what I can to, you know, as he, as he says, do good to the household of faith. I know that people are going to be blinded. In fact, read 2 Timothy. It says that people and seducers will go from worse to worse. It says that there's going to come a time when people have itchy ears and they hear what they want to hear. That's been prophesied. I'm aware of that. There's going to be a falling away. There's going to be apostasy. My responsibility is to live the life that the Lord has called me to live, to encourage that same kind of life in members of the congregation, but policing other people's mentality, that's his job. All right, we want to invite uh, a last question uh, for everyone. Uh, Dr. Jansen, did you want to respond to that? No, I just I put it in the chat. Yeah. <clears throat> we, uh, we appreciate this time. We appreciate this conversation. Um, we are so thankful for, um, for the two of you. Uh, Dr. Allen and Dr. Jansen for uh, sharing with us. We appreciate this, uh, and and we are um, we are interested in joining in this um, this work, this difficult work. And so, thank you for taking your time. I want to thank everyone for sharing questions. We do have one more session. We are uh, we are going to have one more session. So, uh, I want to thank you for all of this. And uh, now, I am going to. Go ahead, uh, unless you guys have final final thoughts, turn it over to Larry Goldman. Well, I'm uh, before I uh, close us out, um, I would invite uh, both uh, Dr. Allen and Dr. Jensen to uh, to leave uh, leave us with a final charge. Could each of you do that? Moving forward. Where... <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, the only charge I can think of is an old charge across generations. The Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you all and grant you shalom to pursue justice, to pursue love, to pursue the beloved community. Um, <clears throat> there are two ideas that come to us in um, through African cultures and languages. One of them is the idea of saubona, I see you. And my challenge would be to go and to see what you are not seeing, to see the people. The second is um, the idea of Ubuntu that I am because we all are. I am because you are. We all are together. Those, those two ideas deeply rooted in communal cultures help us to take our eyes off of our individuality and to raise them to see the community of which we are already a part, that which would be the beloved community that God calls us to. That's our challenge, to go and to be co-creators with God to make that beloved community a reality where we are. Thank you. Thank you both. 
Um, on uh, behalf of one of the sponsors, the Washington Theological Consortium, I do want to thank our other sponsors, the Institute for Justice Formation at the John Leland Center and the Mid-Atlantic Cooperative Baptist Fellowship for um, making this second of our seminars on Saturdays possible. We invite you to join us next Saturday for um, our final uh, seminar, but not our final work. We're hoping this series will launch us all individually and, for, and together forward uh, to continue this work locally and uh, more broadly. I just wanna share uh, a perspective as we close um, that is, is mine. Uh, I find personally as a, uh, a white male that grew up with a lot of privilege, um, went to schools with a lot of privilege, um, um, that um, dealing with issues of systemic racism and just interpersonal racism as well, is uh, a deep inside journey as well as a, a collaborative journey with others uh, inside and outside work. And um, just as a, a bit of my background, um, I uh, grew up uh, in Houston, Texas, but um, with uh, a very Southern family raised in Southern Alabama, um, uh, ecumenical family, uh, Southern Baptist and, and uh, all the way to Catholic and my parents. Um, I grew up as a Presbyterian, still am, uh, but um, went home, you know, to, to Alabama every holiday and sang Dixie and, and wove the, the battle flag. I'm named after a long living veteran um, in the Alabama County that my parents grew up in, uh, who uh, wore gray, not blue, uh, in the great uh, Civil War. Um, I've learned to claim that middle name uh, because uh, of uh, the English Catholic uh, origin of that family, not for the gray clad nature of it, um, to remind myself of my ecumenical uh, background. That's one way of rewriting the history uh, I was given. Uh, but I also grew up in a, a high school, Robert E. Lee High School in Houston, Texas. Uh, and um, we also um, uh, sang Dixie and, and rolled out the general uh, uh, in during halftime with with impunity and, and without shame. The uh, story has to be written, rewritten for me. And uh, thank God uh, the school has renamed itself for Margaret Wisdom, one of the premier African-American educators in Houston. Uh, but I continue to rewrite my own story uh, and often with the help of my black colleagues in uh, our two historical black divinity schools and others who've been patient uh, with my journey and have been willing to challenge me uh, along the way when they choose to. So this prayer uh, is done from that perspective and in that spirit that hopefully will we'll speak to all of us and uh, I invite you then to, to join me in prayer. Oh, holy God, we thank you for the power and graciousness of your love and your truth and your challenge. And we follow as disciples of the way, the truth, and the life that you gave us in your son, Jesus. We pray that you open all our hearts, all our minds, and you activate our hands to help draw us into the work that lies ahead, the work that each one of us must do in his or her own way, the work that we must do collectively in our local communities and more broadly together. For white folks like me, uh, Lord, I ask that you awaken us to a full sense of the experience, the suffering, and the resilient struggles of peoples around us, Black, Native Americans, other peoples of color. I ask you, Lord, to convict us of waking up to our white privilege and our white power and press upon us whether we want to continue to be complicit in white supremacy. I ask you, Lord, to activate those who look like me to acknowledge, repent, transform how we have been swimming in these waters and activate us, God, to find new waters to swim in and to become allies with peoples who have been struggling for equity and 
their rights for many years in this country. For all of us here, oh God, bring us into a walk together, at times arm in arm, toward your beloved community, which you welcome all in the spirit of love and in grace. And God, grant us above all courage to stand in the face of those who deny and resist the full history of our nations and the full history of our local communities. Help us to walk with Jesus, speaking truth, acting in love, and inviting all to grace and to transformation. And we pray this day in Jesus' name. Amen. My friends, uh, welcome uh, uh, again next Saturday. Uh, if you can join us, please do uh, invite a friend uh, if they want to uh, be challenged in this way. And uh, again, thank you to our two uh, presenters today, uh, Dr. Allen and Dr. Jansen, for their powerful challenge and their deep insight. Thank you all.